Hey listener, this is Harry popping in here for a quick hello and to thank you for being a loyal listener. I recently completed Eric Newsom's fantastic, highly recommended book, Make Noise. And one of the things he suggested is to talk to your existing audience, people who are already engaged with the show, that's you, and ask for a small favor. One of the things you can do to help grow the show is to let one person know this week, just one person, about the show and something you enjoy about it. And you can do that on social media or in person at your next lunch or round of drinks at the bar. That's it. I appreciate everything you do. Now let's jump into the show. I firmly believe when the world walks out, a friend walks in. I do not like to kick people when they're down. If someone deserves to be kicked, I'll call them up and kick them. And I won't tell you I kicked them. I will call them up or I won't vote for them, right? But I generally believe if someone's coming on my podcast, my job is to not falsely position them in a light they don't deserve, but to give a platform where they can share what it is they're talking about. I'm not a journalist. I'm a podcast host. Podcast Junkies, episode 265. Welcome back. I'm your host, Harry Duran. If you're new to the show, it's the one where we talk to interesting voices in podcasting and we learn a little bit more about what makes them tick. And last week was no exception. We spoke to Alvin Brook. He's the head of marketing at Buzzsprout. This week, we have a return engagement with Scott Miller. He's the host of Franklin Covey's On Leadership podcast. And he recently published a new book, called From Marketing Mess to Brand Success. This is Scott's second book in that series. And it was interesting to get his take on concepts covered in the book as they relate to the world of podcasting. Scott's an entrepreneur and this 10 part series, Mess to Success, covers everything from leadership and marketing to marriage. And in this episode, we discuss what motivates and inspires Scott and the importance of great storytelling. I thought it'd be fun to go through select chapters in the book and riff with Scott on how they would apply to the world of podcasting, and the conversation did not disappoint. This episode's brought to you by Focusrite, and specifically the Scarlet 2i2 sound card, one of my favorite go-to sound cards, something I use for each and every podcast recording. The 3G line is a go-to for all new podcasters. Find out more at podcastjunkies.com forward slash Focusrite, and the link will be in the show notes as well. Throughout the course of the interview, we talk about the value of respecting your podcast guest, even if you don't always agree with their outlook, and conversely, when to respect yourself enough to avoid people with outrageous beliefs. Scott talks about the value of helping others, cultivating meaningful relationships, and having an abundance mindset. As a podcast host, I'm always conscious of bringing a guest back and making sure that the value that they provide is different than what they did on their first episode, and Scott did not disappoint and really enjoyed his energy. And I told him that next time the next book comes out, we'll have him back for a return engagement as well. Full show notes available at podcastjunkies.com forward slash 265. If you're loving this episode or past episodes, don't forget to leave us a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash podcastjunkies. If you're on the bleeding edge of podcast tech, don't forget to look at the new podcastapps.com list of podcast apps that let you directly contribute to a podcast creator. That's me. If you happen to use any of those or are testing them out, please let me know, harry at podcastjunkies.com. Make sure you stay tuned to the episode where I reveal this week's retention hashtag. But let's get into round two with Scott. Thanks for the second engagement on Podcast Junkies. I know it's a little different probably on a lot of marketing shows, given the title of the book. It's great. What's your goal when you go on a podcast? And at, you don't want to seem like you're dialing it in, right? And you want you said 140. At some point, you're going to repeating. You're going to be repeating stuff you said before. So I'm wondering what you do differently, or do you do some jumping jacks before getting on each call, or how do you keep the energy level high? Well, my energy is natural, so you won't see any wane in that. I will treat you as if it's my first. You know, I'll tell you, a lot of them are very different depending upon the audience, right? So depending upon where the every podcast, there is a unique question that's answered. I try not to repeat myself. I've got you know, after 30 years, I got some reps in me. So I got some stories to pull on. I feel pretty good about, I try to make them each a little bit different individuals. So I, my goal is to help the listener get some value, right? Honestly, right? Make the host look great and get, deliver some value to the listener. 
This remind me, this podcast is for podcasters. Yeah, right? it's for podcasters. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Drew, Drew prepped me about an hour ago in a car, so I'm ready to roll. Yeah, so I thought it was interesting what you were doing. and But I, I'm always curious because this is the type of show where it's sort of like peeling back the veneer. I, the show was inspired from inside the actor studio. I don't know if I told you that last of time. So of course, James, James, well, <laughs> James Lipton. What was his last name? Lipton. James Lipton, yeah. yeah. He was an interesting dude, wasn't he? He passed a few years ago. He did ago, pass yeah? a few years ago. I, yes. I would always, you would see the actors and then you would see them on the show. And I'm like, wow, they're actually human beings. And they're so like. True. <laughs> it's so true. I have, a, I have an amazing story about Jake Gyllenhaal. Okay. On that show, it was such an. He, the, I, the host was a little creepy, right? But I mean, the show was amazing. Yeah, you know what? You can ask any question you want. You know, I'm hosting now the world's largest weekly leadership podcast. It's the world's largest distributed podcast in its space. So I've learned a lot, a lot of mistakes, a lot of lessons learned. Yeah, so I'm just going to unpack stuff, and I think what's helpful for me and what I've always done with this show is just put myself in the shoes of the listener, and just natural curiosity, just trying to peel away things that I'm curious about from a marketing perspective. Yeah, sounds great. Sounds awesome. Tell me, remind me where you are physically, like geographically. Minneapolis. That's right. Minneapolis, yeah. Minnesota. Yeah. That's a great place to be in the summertime, man. Beautiful. It's funny because even though we're going through a heat wave, you appreciate the, you don't mind as much because you know what you just went through in terms of like the sub-zero temperatures. <laughs> yeah. How is the pandemic? Is it subsiding where you are? It is. It's great. subsiding and- uh, is life back to normal? As normal as it can be. I mean, we lifted. they lifted the mandate on June 1st. And so it, it is strange to not leave and grab a, a mask on your way out the door, not have one in your pocket. And, you know, this will be a mess. But you can go into a restaurant right now inside full capacity. No one's wearing masks. Yeah, I don't know about full capacity, but it's definitely without masks. So. Yeah, great. Great to hear. How's it been for you? Same. We've been very blessed. We've been very fortunate. We live in Salt Lake City. Where there's not a you know a massive population like maybe a million people in Salt Lake, sure. And you know we were strict followers, right? I mean we wore masks everywhere. We got vaccinated back in early March or even late February, late February maybe. And our boys go to private school. We were very blessed to have them, so they went to school the whole year in person. They had a very okay. strict mask policy and social distancing. So I lost two friends that died. I lost one as well. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My best friend from high school. Oh my gosh. Really? Yeah. It was, how, uh, remind had, me, how old are you? I'm 50. I'm 52. Yeah. He was 50 and he, did he have some underlying health issues? He was a little bit overweight. We had fallen out of touch, probably been about 10 years since we had chatted, but you know, just he's for those five years of four, four years of high school and in even a couple years into college, we were best friends. Yes. How did you learn of his passing? His a mutual friend reached out and then got back in contact with his wife. And, you know, just like everyone else, he just, he went on a respirator or the ventilator. Yeah, and once that happened, we started to get worried, but we, I mean, you just think that they're going to pull out and th they're going to come out of it. And when it was, he would come in and out and it was tenuous, like two weeks. And then yes. Yes. when I finally got the news, it was definitely a gut punch and it brought the virus and pandemic home in a way that uh, was, was pretty wild. Right. Are you a parent? No. No. no, no. I wasn't until later in life. I had children. I was forty-two. I'm fifty-three now. Yeah. But it, you know, it was very sobering for me because you know, back in whatever month, I don't know, November or whatever month, whatever was the worst. I don't remember anymore. But it was sobering. I mean, you know, if you caught it, you could go to the hospital and die, not see your family again. You're like, oh my gosh, my children, right? I mean, I was making you know contingency plans. It's any day, right? It could happen to any of us. Crazy. No, it's, I mean, it's all relevant and it's all relevant to what's happening in, in this world. And people don't think about those types of things. And I'm wondering if an experience like that colors how you change what your mission is in life. And I know p part of the book and part of the new book is, is to getting, you know, this word out about how you can make people better marketers. But I'm just wondering for you personally, what drives you and, and why the need for a second book and then just sort of the motivation. Do you want to answer on air or do you want to? Or... I want, yeah, on air. Yeah. You know, I worked 25 years inside of a corporate giant, right? A Franklin Covey company. It's been a great career and I still consult with them. But I think the pandemic, like for all of us, it changed everybody's values. It changed the perspective for everything. And so I want to spend the next half of my career, the next third of my career, teaching people the lessons that I've learned and the things that I've learned maybe later in life. 
And so I've written several books. I have three books coming out this year. I use my pandemic time wow. very productive. <laughs> I wrote productive. three books. And uh, this is the second book in the 10 Mess to Success series. And so Marketing Mess to Brand Success was really the culmination of my eight years as a chief marketing officer of a global brand and company. And I thought if I can continue to share not just my successes, but my messes, people can learn through them. Not everyone has my talent. I don't have your talent. I don't have your skills. You don't have my skills. I can't replicate what you've done in your life, but I can learn from your mistakes. I can walk around that metaphorical pothole. And so that's why I wrote these books was to give back, honestly, was to teach some of the lessons that I had learned. And so there's no question I'm spending more time with my family, perhaps to their horror sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm less concerned on, I'm less concerned about my net worth than I was two years ago, right? I want to have enough to protect my family and to position my family well, but I'm less concerned about, let me tell you this. Here's how I would say it. You'll never have enough until you've defined how much is enough. Attention, credit, fame, love, sure. money, cars. And I think the pandemic has helped me define how much is enough in most areas of my life. And now I'm working on checking those off. Accomplishments, experiences, safety net for my wife, who is sure. a full-time stay-at-home mom, setting my children up responsibly so that they can have options, not luxury, not be lazy, but making sure that one thing we learned in the pandemic was, you know, people that had resources, they were in the same storm, yeah, but they were in a different boat. And I want to just do my best to make sure that my family is in as sturdy boat as possible for the next storm. Do you think about terms of like legacy? I do, but I think that's nice of you to ask. I think as my brand grows, I'm certainly going to have a legacy, right? As my influence grows and people that follow me and connect with me grow. But I think more about my legacy with my three boys than I do. I mean, I mean, than I do my Instagram followers, right? Or, you know, with my friends, yes. But I think as a father now, by the way, I never wanted to be a father. I never thought I would even be married. I met my wife at the gym and in my, in my <laughs> late 30s, I got married in my 40s. I, and uh, part of the deal was if we get married, we have kids. I'm like, well, you're hot. Let's get married. We'll have kids. <laughs> that works. My wife is smart, not just hot. But we have three boys that we're, we have to remind ourselves how blessed we are because three boys can wear you down, right? Sure. Our boys, we had three boys in under five years, which was a lot for us. I think to answer your question, I think I most focused on my legacy with my boys, meaning not just what will they remember of me, but what did they learn from me that set them up to make wise decisions, to treat all people well, to be kind, to be productive, to be selfless, to give back, to make good decisions, to protect themselves. I come back to, if I learned any lesson in the pandemic, it's prepare for a storm. Did you read, or I don't know if we talked about this last time, the book Anti-Fragile? No. Is uh, Nicholas Taleb, I'll, it's, it's three names. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. But he talks about this idea of, of creating something that's not just resistant, but it actually encourages breakage so that it comes back stronger in the way like a bone breaks and it comes back and the bone is actually stronger. So it's, it's preparing for these, you know, he also wrote Black Swan. So these sort of Black Swan events that yes, no yep. one could see coming. Yes. There's no possible way to prepare for something that you can't see coming. Yeah. But you're, there's some resilience or strength or adversity to recover from breakage built into whatever it is that you're doing so that you can bounce back. And I think it's something that what you were alluding to about these folks that are in, we're in a better boat yes. than most people. Yeah. It's, I remember you recommending those books to me, you know, and even the last couple of weeks, right. With all the issues going on with cyber, you know, cyber crime and sure. cyber terrorism. And it's clearly the future of our world, right. Is this cyber. And so my wife and I have, I won't give you my address, but you know, we've just made, we've made some precautions. You know, we need water, we need food, yeah. we need cash, we need options, right? We need to make sure that we are as protected as possible for the next, whatever that is. We won't, can't be fully prepared, but we can be more prepared than we were a week ago. So, you know, we're not doomsday-ish, right? Or any of that, but we're normal, healthy, responsible people. But, you know, we think more and more around the government isn't going to protect you and nor should they be your only protection, right? And we have no family here and where we live. So we just have got to be responsible. I think it's a good message to everybody that you've got to make sure you've got a network of family and friends 
and people that can help you and you also be prepared to help them. Because that's what helped the pandemic, right? Was the government wasn't shipping, you know, ventilators to Salt Lake City. Maybe they tried. I don't know. I'm sure they shipped a lot of places. But it was the people who were as prepared as possible that could insulate themselves from the damage. And, you know, I just, to respect to the hundreds of thousands of people that succumbed to this pandemic, I don't mean to say had they been better prepared, but some of them perhaps, right? Had they had, you know, more knowledge or more access to healthcare or better access to, you know, a job where they didn't have to go to work and get exposed, right? I mean, how fortunate some of us were to be able to work from home. There were millions of Americans that didn't have that privilege and many gave their life because of it. How do you think about teaching something like that to a younger generation or your sons and just other than living through it? Because I'm sure it's something, depending on what age they are, they'll, they're going to take away a lot from these. what's happened over the past you know, year and a half. I think in many ways, we tried to protect our boys from it as much as possible. And they knew it was happening. You couldn't escape it. They're wearing masks to school. They very much knew what was happening. But we tried to insulate them because there's things you don't need to know at the age of six. There's things you don't need to know at the age of nine, right? So we are responsible in educating them, but not creating fear in them. And I think the big lesson that we have taught them is, you know, be prepared. It's a great example. We have a, a luxury car that is fairly new and it broke down in the Arizona desert a few weeks ago on the way back, right? And so, you know, it was fascinating to teach my boys we have options. We have credit cards. We have triple A. We can book a flight. We have so many options. It's okay, boys. Many people don't have all those options. So I actually used what was a fairly annoying experience, your car breaking down in the middle of the Arizona desert on a 98 degree day that you just spent an obscene amount of money on, right? And just teaching them it's okay. We have options, right? We have a mobile phone. We have a credit card. We can stay in a hotel. If we have to, we can fly home. We can have our car towed. And I was using that experience to show our three boys, we have those options because we've been blessed with a good education and we've had privileges that others don't have. And dad also works really hard and mom helps to manage the money so that there is money for a rainy day. These are simple, simple lessons. Not everyone has those luxuries, but this taught me as well, you know, to make sure that we're just responsible with our resources and also have resources when someone else is in a bind that may need to call on us that hasn't had the same privilege that we've had, right? I had a lot of head starts in life, being just white, being male, being living in America, right? Being with parents that educated us. So we have a rainy day fund to help people and family and friends that may need help. I think it's just, you know, the big lesson we've learned, right, is all that matters is our relationships and helping each other. It's all that matters. That's so important. And I think it's something that we've been made consciously aware of this idea of being able to help people that need our help and not in a position, like you said, and in a position of privilege for whatever reason. And I think that's probably an important lesson that your sons are going to learn as well. And I'm always interested in that. And we are actually trying to have a, a child as well. So it'll be a first for me and it'll, I'll be in my fifties as well. So I've been sort of May God have mercy on your lack of sleep and your sanity. <laughs> Trying to prepare as best as I possibly I wish you great success yeah, there. For that. So shifting gears a little bit, you always had an idea for this series that you were going to be planning. This was going to be, I think you said 10 part. What, what, talk about a little bit about the idea and that and how that yeah, came out. Yeah, it's actually not true, right? Okay. So I was privileged to host this podcast for the company on leadership with Scott Miller. I ran Franklin Covey's book division. I still lead that division with another vice president in the firm. And so I always knew the book business well, and I thought about writing a, a series of books, not all in the same genre, but I wrote this first book called Management Mess to Leadership Success. Almost two years ago, it did extremely well. And it was my assistant, Drew, this young guy in his early 20s, that he said to me, you know what? You ought to write a whole series. Marketing mess, job mess, career mess, communication. It was, you know, here I am a chief marketing officer of a global firm. And it really was my then 23-year-old assistant that had the idea. It was not my idea. It was his idea. Now, I had the connections and I had the skill and I had the knowledge and the influence and the brand. But the fact of the matter is the lesson there is the successful people are those that are open to be influenced by those that you might least expect it. You wouldn't expect that a 50-year-old CMO would be taking his insights from, you know, the upstart just out of college junior person. And I don't mean to create any, you know, prejudices around that other than 
it's not where you typically would look to be influenced on the book you're going to write. But the fact of the matter is, it was my junior assistant, his first ever corporate job that had this idea. And I'm giving him credit on air. I'm not giving him royalties. <laughs> I'm paying him sufficiently. He's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm setting him up for success because he's a smart cat. And I'm loyal to him and him to me. But I think I, in full disclosure, it was Drew Young's idea to create the Mess of Success series, not Scott Miller's. I'm just doing it. And how many of them have you planned out? Well, so I have all 10 planned. Okay. I have written the first three. Marketing Mess, of course, is just out this month. Job Mess to Career Success comes out in January. Communication Mess to Influence Success comes out in 2022. Then Sales Mess to Client Success comes out. Then there is Relationship Mess, Parenting Mess, hopefully Marriage Mess, which my, hopefully my marriage will still be intact. Uh, the boys try to destroy it as much as they can, but we're not letting them. So I've got them planned out. I think seven more over the next seven years. Very nice. Well, if you need a, some contribution for a chapter on podcasting, happy to contribute. <laughs> Podcast mess to re listener success. I like that. Something like that. Yeah. Never Audience know. success. Yeah. So when you're thinking about this, the fact that it was marketing related and not leadership related, how do you think about those topics in relation to the position you held at Franklin? Well, so I've always been a formal leader, right? Leader of yeah. people. Not sure I should have been. I don't think everyone should be a leader of people. I've spoken about that extensively. Not everyone should be a podcast host or an anesthesiologist. Not everyone should be a leader of people. I wrote that first book to help people understand this is what leadership is like. It's tough. It's hard. It sometimes sucks. It's unrewarding often in the short term. And I think the book did well because I took a different approach. I took an approach from, it's not all rosy. My career hasn't been all successful. It's been ups and downs and two steps forwards and sometimes three steps back. So the next natural book was marketing mess to brand success because I was the CMO and I, I share a lot of successes and a lot of messes in the book. It was a natural progression for me. And in many ways, the marketing book is actually a leadership book. I've had people tell me, this is actually a leadership book. They would know it was a compliment. I'll tell you, I think the book is really how to build a great career in marketing, how to be a great marketer. Everybody's in sales, whether you like it or not. And everybody's in marketing, whether you know it or not. And, but I think where the book is really going to thrive is with sales leaders. I think sales leaders, will business owners will read the book and then they'll buy it to their marketing person and say, I need you to read this book. I actually think it'll be more popular in the sales segment than perhaps even in the marketing segment. But they dovetail together. They follow a similar format. I write a very fast paced, kind of easy breezy story kind of book. The chapters are not War and Peace is not good to great from Jim Collins. These are easy books. I'm sure some are insulted. That's okay. I have just enough money to not care about whether you like me or not, but I'm going to keep writing my books because they're resonating with a large audience. Basically, I'm writing the book that I needed to read when I was earlier in my career. So I keep that lens in mind, 30 challenges in every book. And so I do my best to write the book that I needed. What's interesting is that it is almost like a manual, if you will, for someone who's getting into marketing. And you cover everything from trade shows to like how to you know work, build on your team and budgets. And so that it's literally almost a choose your own adventure type book as well. I well said. Feedback. Yeah, well said. You know, I did not write a book about SEO and marketing automation and Google Analytics and predictive. And I didn't, I didn't write a book about that. There's plenty of books written by academic and professors that, you know, entrepreneurs. I wrote a book from a guy who was a chief marketing officer running a 35 person marketing division and a global company and all of the politics and red tape and mistakes and temptations that we all face. And there are millions of people employed in those types of jobs. And I meant it in many ways to be a career guide, right? Is don't think this way, think this way. Don't get sucked into that. Be prepared for this. And so it is sort of a collection of 30 challenges with stories that I think are very relatable. If you want to know how to build your tech stack, this is not your book. If you're looking at how to build, you know, user personas extensively, this is not your book. Although I talk about your tech stack and I talk about, you know, buyer personas and brand personas, but I kind of water ski across a lot of challenges that I think nearly every marketer will face in their career in the hopes that you won't make a lot of the same mistakes that I made myself or I saw other marketers make in my 30-year career. 
I think what's important is even if you were to skim it at that high level for each of the topics, it's almost like a checklist to say, am I or is someone in my organization keeping an eye on this or who's accountable You know, for each one of these? And it could be in a small organization or a solopreneur, it could be the one person. Like I literally have to keep all these things in mind and sometimes I'm the marketer until I hire a marketing person. Right, right. But, but it is interesting to have it as something to keep in mind. And even as your organization grows, you need to start thinking about some things, the bar personas, the trade shows, the budgets, the tech stack. And it feels like a book that would be pretty dog-eared because you just keep coming back to it as your organization so. grows. Yeah, I hope so. I appreciate that. I, I think so. I think I meant to be funny. There's some, you know, uproariously funny stories and mistakes that I made. And, you know, as I mature in my career, I'm not trying to be the guy that was a full mess, right? No one wants to buy a book from a guy that has, you know, a thousand messes, but I am using vulnerability as a teaching tool. That to say, here are challenges that I face. Sometimes I rose to the occasion and sometimes I didn't. And if you want to build a deliberate, successful career, like in, I did. Mine was not a straight line, but I think people that read it will enjoy my transparency and my vulnerability in the messes and the successes. I know as they when they ask this question, it's always hard when they're in reference to your children, but in reference to the 30 challenges, do you have some that are a favorite or some that resonate with you more than others? Oh, I have a favorite child. Trust me. I'm just <laughs> going to tell you their name on the phone. <laughs> I love them all the same. I just like one more than the other. <laughs> you know, there's so many, right? You know, one is building your business acumen. I think it is fair to say, although it is a broad generalization, People that have careers in marketing are usually more right-brained than left-brained. They are creative minds. They usually don't love processes. They probably think more organically and less systemically, right? They probably hate processes and they love, you know, the joy that comes with unbounded creativity. As a result, I think you have a lot of very high energy, high creative minds that don't always know the business of the business. They don't always know their company's money-making model. They often don't have an MBA or an economics degree. So I talk about you know, building your business acumen. As a marketer, you need to know what is the money-making model of your company. Five levers, right? Margin, cash, velocity, customers, and growth. You need to be able to read a P&L. You need to be able to know how to calculate EBITDA and what is SG&A versus cost of goods. You will build your credibility when you understand how your company makes money. It sounds like a simple thing, but most marketers don't necessarily know what are their highest or lowest margin products. And are they in the velocity business? Or are they in the growth business? So for a lot of early marketers, I would say really focus on your business acumen. Stay close to the cash. One of the early challenges, I think it's number three, is called stay close to the cash. Being able to articulate as a marketer, how are you part of the cash generating machine? Are you directly accountable for generating revenue or profit or saving money? Because how you will get disrupted, how you will get fired is when some campaign fails and you're way off deep into Google Analytics or AI or marketing automation. And you're wondering why you got fired because you don't even know what your second quarter results were. You know, you've got to understand how you closely tie to the company's money-making model, and you should not be shy to articulate it. What I love about that, and something I had chatted with Drew briefly, is as I was reading through the challenges, what struck me is how many of them are applicable to podcast hosts and podcast creators. Because when you think about, you know, in, in times in marketing, you're thinking about acquiring clients, but from a podcasting perspective, your focus is on acquiring listeners and developing that relationship with listeners. And so even early on in your first one, where you say it's the customer stupid, and you talk about committing to a 30 minute weekly meeting that focuses only on customers. If you were to change that to focus on listeners, then whatever all the advice that you follow with is very applicable. So I think what I'm trying to have the listener key in on, even though we're talking about marketing, it's a book about marketing. If you, as a podcast host or responsible for the creation of podcasts in an organization, which you know someone was in, in Franklin Covey, right? Like they need to be thinking about these things in the same way you think about how marketing is supporting the whole business. How is podcast supporting the marketing initiatives and the business initiatives as well? So well said. One of my favorite challenges in this book is challenge 11, and that is to find your smallest viable market. 
I think it's so counterintuitive, right? Everybody that went to business school, you were taught to create your total addressable market, right? What is the largest viable market? It's my friend and the marketing genius, Seth Godin, that popularized this idea in his book, This Is Marketing, that instead of net fishing, you should be spear fishing. You know, how do you create the most successful podcast with the fewest number of listeners? That may seem counterintuitive. How do you create your biggest impact with your first customer? Like, what is your first listener? What is her name? What is her profile? What is her circumstance? What is her challenge? What is she hiring you to do for her, right? Why is she investing 38 minutes with you? And once sure. you know that person, then who is your second person? I think we try to do the Oklahoma land rush, which is, you know, a million YouTube followers and 45,000 Instagram followers. And instead of getting very deliberate, unnaturally, unnaturally focused and deliberate on what is the circumstance my listener is in and how do I hit it right on every episode? As opposed to, I'm trying to be all things to all people. And it's natural. You know, when you fill out your SBA loan application, you need to have your total addressable market. You know what? Everyone is not your customer. Not everyone should come to your restaurant. Not everyone should read my book. Yeah. But the more confident you are in your value proposition and the more time you spend to understand your client, your customer, your listener's circumstance, what exact circumstance are they in? And when you address that, you will build your listenership, your customer base, maybe not faster with more robust accuracy than if you were to try to, you know, spread a net across an entire ocean and scoop up fish because you'll get fish, but you'll also get bicycle tires and shark's teeth and bicycles, right? I'm wondering how you thought about that when you were having conversations with your guests and conscious of not only engaging with them and getting the most value out of them and valuing their time, but also thinking about the listener. Are they getting value from this conversation that we're having? And I'm wondering how much of that, how much, how often that would cross your mind during interviews. This is the great question, especially for those who are podcast hosts, is because look at my podcast for a moment, right? Largest now in the world in its space. We position as a leadership podcast. But, you know, last week I had a personal finance expert on, right? I had Matthew McConaughey on. We had General McChrystal on. We've got Ursula Burns, the first ever black female CEO of a Fortune 500 company next week from Xerox. And so leadership is a broad category, right? Leadership is culture. Leadership is sales. Leadership is profit. Leadership is customers. Leadership is marketing. Leadership is brand. So I have the ability to have a pretty broad podcast. But... I generally know who our listeners are. They're generally chief human resource officers, chief talent officers, chief C-suite leaders. Not all of them are, of course, but we try to keep it interesting. We obviously know that the demographic for podcasts is skewing lower and lower and broader, and we want to be a relevant brand, so we try to bring on guests. We had Emmanuel Acho on. He's the former NFL player that wrote the book, Uncomfortable Conversation with a Black Man. Because diversity, equity, and inclusion is a leadership issue. Most people over the age of 40 have no idea who Emmanuel Acho is, right? He was, of course, the host of The Bachelor this last episode. But everybody who's under 40 knows who Emmanuel Acho is. And you certainly do if you're black or if you're, you know, a person of color. So you have to know your audience and know your voice and also be willing to move outside your comfort zone. One of my challenges in marketing mess is... Challenge seven, bruise hard and heal fast. So, you know, we take some exceptions. We had a we had a survivor, one of I think the two survivors of a Pakistani commercial airline crash a year ago. Two people survived. We had one of them on our program. It was a cap. This webcast will change your life. You might argue, well, what does that have to do with leadership? You had a survivor of a plane crash on Oh, there's a lot to do, right? I mean, talk about resiliency and pivot and change your mind and change your values. And these are things that are these are things that leaders can relate to. So you got to be able to know sometimes you're going to hit it, sometimes you're not. Bruise hard, heal fast, move on, and have confidence in yourself. 
The other one that caught my eye was uh, Challenge 15, Friend Your Competition. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's interesting because I think as a, as a podcasters, they see anyone else who's doing something similar as someone that's in competition with them. And and to your point, there, there, there's, do, there's dozens of podcasts about leadership. No, there's probably right? hundreds <laughs> of podcasts about leadership, but I'll bet you some of them are better than the one that I host for Franklin Covey. I do learn a lot. I think it's important to friend your competition, right? This, you know, back when you and I were, you know, in the early part of our careers, it was very common to have your value proposition as a salesperson be trashing your competition, right? You sold against your competition. You knew more about their weaknesses than you did your strengths. This was a, a sales tactic. Well, let me tell you, newsflash, people, those days are over. If you want to learn how to invent and pivot and reinvent and rebrand and disrupt yourself, you will be learning from your competition. You'll be calling them. You'll be lifting them up. You'll be calling them out in a good way. I, so far, I mean, I've mentioned a lot of people, including Seth Godin. He wrote the best marketing book ever written called This Is Marketing. Go buy his book before you buy my book. I think friending your competition is a great leadership competency, especially in marketing, because you never know how small the world is. You never know when you're going to need a referral, when you're going to look to acquire them, you're going to be acquired by them, or you know, you just never know, right? So you will govern yourself accordingly. And if you want to disrupt your skills, you will friend your competition to learn from them. And I also just think, I think, you know, there's two types of mindsets, a scarce mindset or an abundance mindset. I just do not believe that the podcast I host is smaller because you host your podcast. I don't listen to only one podcast and people come and people go and they take nuggets and they learn. And I just choose to open every day with, there's enough for everyone. How can I help others get theirs? And how can I also get mine? Rising tide, lifting all boats. Here you go. Challenge 17, hire people smarter than you. What I thought was interesting about uh, one of the takeaways there is really doing an analysis of asking yourself, how might my strengths be holding me back? And how could I also use my strengths to improve my experience? And a lot of podcasters start out solo, but there could also be podcasters in an organization. And I think Sometimes we put out a show that we just like the sound of our own voice and we think everyone's going <laughs> to flock to our show. But I think that sort of resonated with me of hiring and partnering with people who may know more than you. And that may be intimidating at times. Oh, my gosh. I think this is a, a genius one to call out for your listenership because no one wants to work with or for the genius in the room, right? They want to work for someone who is insatiably curious, who has this sort of inquisitive mind where you're humble enough, you're confident enough to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you are. I have no idea how to put the podcast I host on a Stitcher. I have no idea what SoundCloud even is, although I say it all the time. I have no idea what SoundCloud is, right? I don't know how to get my program onto anything. I got genius people around me that are constantly coaching me. And so it is, in the words of our co-founder at Franklin Covey, Dr. Stephen R. Covey, that said, Humble leaders are more concerned with what is right than being right. And so when you ask yourself, so, you know, how do we get the biggest reach to the right people in the right circumstance? Don't try to have all the answers. Show the humility to say, I do this well. What I do well is a couple of things. I have a large network, so I'm able to land great guests on the podcast. I am a pretty voracious and fast reader. So I can absorb their books or if they don't have a book, know their background. And I'm a pretty good extemporaneous question asker. I'm pretty easy to pivot and talk on the dime. It is the team that does all of the, the sound and the onboarding and the promotion and the splicing and editing. And I, I, mean, I couldn't edit something to save my life. And I have no problem saying that. I'm surrounded by a team of insanely smart people that are smarter than me in nearly every facet of a podcast. And I think they would say, and Scott is a better host than they would be. Maybe they don't always agree with that because they give me feedback sometimes <laughs> on what I should do better. And I ask for it and we all have each other's backs, right? We all know what crucial part of it that we're playing. And that's the essence of a great team is when you have leaders who are focused on lifting everyone up and that they're humble enough to hire people who are noticeably smarter than they are. And you work in an environment of trust when you can say, you know what, guys? What is Stitcher? I have no idea, right? What is SoundCloud? I have no idea. Teach me that. That's a great team. 
Do you recall or just a, a sample piece of advice the team might have given you about uh, a different direction to take on the podcast as a host? Definitely. Several things. Something that I struggle with is what is the role of a host, right? You know, some people tell you listeners come for the guest, they stay for the host. Larry King always said that. That weighs on me. Other people say, you know, the host's job is just to step back and to set up the guest, and you aren't supposed to give your own insights and your own stories. And they say, no, 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 no. Scott, you've got 30 years of, you know, all this. Tell your stories also. So there's always a balance. I think my biggest challenge is when I ask a question, is knowing when to stay on that question and go deeper versus pivoting to the next question. I know I have nine questions and I have 35 minutes. It's kind of a nice balance of keeping the pace moving and knowing when to stay on a topic that I know the guest has more on and my job is to tease it out of them in a way that they feel comfortable doing, but for whatever reason, weren't comfortable sharing without me teasing it out. So I'm working better on the cadence of knowing when to keep it moving forward and when to kind of set and learn more on the topic. I'm also learning that my intro is sometimes too long, right? Is that sometimes I'll use, I'll be, you know, 30, 45, a minute long to kind of gear up when they want me to get right in. We don't do commercials. We actually don't edit. We actually do not okay. edit in the middle at all. We goes live and we go through with no editing unless there's some, you know, outrageous thing. I think we may have edited one episode in 170 because the guest was literally insane. And we ended up not even sharing it because the person said things that were outrageous. Those are the things I. How do you on. handle that during an interview? I'm always curious, you know, because you know, this inside in the trenches stories. But like, as that's happening, like, what's going through your mind? So you would recognize the name of this person, of who, of course, I will not share. They got on. They were very gracious. They were a world-renowned name in their space. They looked great. They were on cue. They were ready to go. We had a lovely conversation. About 35 minutes in, they made some outrageous statements about Donald Trump and his opponents, Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, and Obama. And I kind of let it go thinking maybe it was kind of funny, but it, in my opinion, it was you know kind of outrageous. I'll tell you, the person said, you know, Donald Trump made his money the old fashioned way he earned it. I'm not sure everyone would agree with that. But then True. he said, unlike Bill Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and Joe Biden, they all stole their billions. Well, I don't think Joseph Biden has a billion dollars. And I'm pretty <laughs> sure he didn't steal his money. And then so I kind of thought, well, this is crazy. I thought, well, maybe we can edit it out. Well, then about a minute later, he repeated it. And I knew I had about 10 minutes in. So I'm thinking, well, this sucks because I'm not airing this thing ever. This is going in the garbage can. And he's so big in his brand, he'll never even notice if I air it or not. So I'm keeping a smile. I keep going on. We finish it off. I landed. I'm very gracious. I thank him. And we, for about five minutes, debated behind the camera, could we save this? And we decided we couldn't. And we didn't air it. And he doesn't know. And that was it. There was another one that I interviewed. This happened to be a female. And uh, she wrote a book that you may or may not know. But I finished the interview. And it was a pretty poor interview. She wasn't trained that well. She was all, constantly looking down at her laptop, not at her camera. I host a video. It's, my podcast is video also. Her questions weren't well thought through. At the end of the podcast, I thanked her. And then I called her an hour later. And I said, I want to retape your podcast. I think you can do better. I want oh, wow. to lift your brand. And I want to retape it two weeks from now. In the privacy of this call, here are some things you need to perfect. You know, she came back and she nailed it two weeks later. I could have aired it. It would have been fine. She wouldn't have looked very good. Her gender is immaterial in this conversation. But I, I chose to call her. Unlike the first person who, by the way, or second, I could have called him too. But quite frankly, I kind of got a distaste, not because of my politics. I just thought, you know, you don't say that stuff on a podcast. That's just not, first of all, it's not true. I'm not sure... Donald Trump earned all of his money, honestly, to tell the truth. And I'm quite certain <laughs> yeah. that Obama didn't steal all of his money, including the billion dollars that I'm quite sure he doesn't have. I mean, I know the difference between a million and a billion. So yeah. <laughs> you know, as a host, I use some discretion also on making sure everyone looks good. And when they look like a crazy person, I won't air it. It's only happened once. 
I think that's very admirable what you did with that second guest Thank because you. it feels like you always have, you know, you're conscious of the fact how they're going to be presented to your audience. And you had some confidence that they knew what they were talking about, but just in this specific instance, they weren't presenting themselves in the best light. So I'm just curious, you know, as your, your thought process, is that just something that's inherent in you, this idea of like making sure if you, you are giving people a platform that they that they perform at their best. And if you can help that along, that you'll always do that. Well, that's, first of all, I'm not a journalist. I'm not a reporter. I'm not an investigative journalist. I'm a guy to host a podcast for a public company, right? So that may be unique. Secondly, in life, I don't trash talk people. I don't get on Twitter. I don't jump on board campaigns. I firmly believe when the world walks out, a friend walks in. I do not like to kick people when they're down. If someone deserves to be kicked, I'll call them up and kick them. And I won't tell you I kicked them. I will call them up or I won't vote for them, right? But I generally believe if someone's coming on my podcast, my job is to not falsely position them in a light they don't deserve, but to give a platform where they can share what it is they're talking about. I'm not a journalist. I'm a podcast host. And so I do. I just think I, unless you are a sociopath or you're a pedophile or you're a racist or you're a convicted felon that's not turned their life around. I, by the way, I have had people that were drug dealers and drug users and went to prison. I have one on my, on my podcast. I named Doug Bost, who I fell in love with because he wasn't a hypocrite. He had learned from his ways and he had not done anything seriously wrong. I mean, he was a petty, you know, he had a drug problem in his teens and he had a really rough upbringing and he's turned his life around and I'm a, proud to call him a friend. But I think if someone, you know, deserves a platform, then they deserve a little bit of grace from the host to help them get their message out as well. I haven't ever said that live before, but that's kind of <laughs> what my modus operandi is. Yeah, I've always thought it's a special skill to have someone on your show that you don't generally, you, there may be things you don't agree with, but you can both have a conversation and be agreeable sure. and allow people to express an opinion that may be different than one that, that that's one that you hold. But to your point, if both parties are being respectable yeah. about it, then I, I think it makes for an engaging conversation. Well, I think you just lost, you just illustrated what's been lost in American political discourse and civility, right? I do. I will tell you, I'm a lifelong Republican. I'm not a supporter of the previous administration, but I do think the damage that was done with demonizing your opponent has permeated every aspect of our society. And I do not subscribe to that. I have no idea what your religion is, what your political beliefs are. I can't imagine you and I couldn't have a very gracious dinner and agree to disagree and leave and book another dinner and have you know a great conversation. I just think it's repugnant people that demonize and kick their opponent. These are not your enemies. These are people who have different fields of experience. They have different narratives, different journeys, different struggles, different triumphs, different fears. And I just, that's not my, my mindset at all. I don't know that I want to be a healer or a unifier or a moderator or an ombudsman. I want to be the guy that provides a platform to people that deserve a platform. And we try to vary our guests by race and by gender and occasionally by nationality and by background. And not everyone is an author. Not everyone is a Pulitzer Prize winning author. I'll tell you, I had, um, I had a guest recently take me to task off air because she called, she used the term microaggressions that when I referred to her, I opened the podcast and I said, sometimes we have, you know, business titans and best-selling authors and thought leaders. And other times we shine the camera on people who are on the rise, who are building their brand and who are in the trenches like you and I. And she felt like I had diminished her. And I apologized. It wasn't my intent. But I mean, you know, she didn't have 8 million Instagram followers and she wasn't a former ambassador and she wasn't a Pulitzer Prize winning author. And I didn't mean it to diminish her. I just meant to say, sometimes you've got celebrities and sometimes you've got people like you and I and we can still learn from them. So, you know, you learn as a podcast host, bruise hard, heal fast. You cannot serve all people all the time. Yeah, and there's something about a pendulum swinging so far to the other way where everyone feels like, you know, you have to be careful what you say in a specific context and in front of specific audiences because although your intention may have been, you know, 
purely positive. You know, there's people interpreting it from a lens of hypersensitivity right now. So I, we're in an interesting time right now, and it's it's probably going to take a while for it to, to come back towards a little bit uh, more towards center. But I think it's it behooves us all to be conscious that that's the that the environment we're in, whether we like it or not, whether we think it's fair or not. So well I think it's it's important. I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight Challenge 28, Develop Your Storytelling Craft. It's as a podcaster, I think what's most important and the the shows that I resonate with are ones where I can hear the story of the guest. And so I'm curious why that that one is, is near and dear to your heart. Well, so Nancy Duarte and Donald Miller are two of the biggest names in marketing and messaging. Nancy Duarte is on the West Coast. She owns the firm Duarte. She wrote a series of books called Data Story, Resonate, Slideology. And Donald Miller, of course, everybody knows, who wrote the book, Building a Story Brand and Business Made Simple, Marketing Made Simple. They both had a massive influence on my own leadership journey, my marketing journey, and the power of being a great communicator through story. This does not mean you have to go to your state's Renaissance Festival and share Shakespeare, and this is not who I am. You can tell from my narrative, right? But you know, it's the power of story is undeniable. And I think a lot of people don't think they have enough stories in them. Oh, you do? Dig deeper. Or people don't think they're great storytellers. So you can learn that skill. Oh, you definitely can learn to become a better storyteller, right? As your antagonist and your protagonist. As Nancy would say, stories are simply what is and what could be. What is and what could be. What is and what could be. And so if you work on your storytelling skills, you paint a visual for someone, whether it be like literally a visual or it's an audible visual that allows them to identify with you, to relate to you, to understand the struggle, how to move forward, how to relate to the triumph or the setback. You know, every sitcom has the same formula, right? There is (laughs) conflict and there is resolution. There is conflict and there is resolution. So what I do, and by the way, I do not write or read fiction ever. I write and read nonfiction. I'm probably, to quote my wife, I live too much in reality. I'm an uber (laughs) pragmatist. I'm not a pessimist. I'm not an optimist. I tend to be a realist in life. I probably lean more towards an optimist than I do a pessimist. But so I don't like, I'm not a good story writer. I couldn't write a fiction story with dragons to save my life. But I have three boys and I'm a fairly creative person. So, you know, lots of evenings I'll go up And I will just work on my storytelling skills and extemporaneously to start telling stories. So there was this guy named General Hitchback and General Hitchback lost his left hand in a mining accident. Don't ask me about it. Let's just say there was a snake and uh, dynamite involved and the kids are loving this, right? And I say, so what happened is, is, you know, Mr. Hitchback came upon Wonder Woman's visible jet. Well, he couldn't see it, but he bumped up against it. Did you know her jet was invisible? Well, the problem is, is the front half of it, you get the point, right? And as long as there's like, you know, farting involved in it and like, you know, a superhero. <laughs> Superheroes, yeah. But, but this sounds funny, but it's it really helps to build kind of my storytelling skills. I got off on a tangent there, but storytelling is such a valuable skill for CEOs, for CFOs. What is our story? Where are we going? How are you part of that? What is the antagonist? How can you be part of the solution? What does success look like? What does it feel like? Same for, for a podcast guest, right? Is being able to set someone up to tell their story. I will often tell the guest, I don't tell them my questions unless they ask for them. And then I will tell them my questions. Oftentimes I'll come into a podcast, about 35 minutes is my sweet zone. I'll tell them, you know, I'm going to ask you about six or eight questions. We might get to four. We might get to 12 of them. I might make some up along the way. I will never ambush you. I promise them that. I might ask you a tough question if you wrote about something or you've said something, but I try to build the podcast where they can tell their story, whether they know they are or not, by the types of questions I ask and kind of the cadence and arc of it. Yeah. And, and I think what you're doing there is also you're, you're cognizant of taking the listener through that journey as well. So not only are you holding your guest's hand, but you're sort of holding your listener's hand as well and yeah. saying, this is what you can expect from me. This is what you can expect from my guest. And so there's no surprises. And, and you're, I love the fact that you do that. And there are times when someone has an especially compelling story, like this survivor of this Pakistani jet crash or Elizabeth Smart, who was the Utah rape victim and kidnap victim, right? And I will tell them off air, if you are comfortable, I would like for you just to answer the questions 
in the order that I've asked them, because I'd like to build an arc and allow you to share, you know, later what happened, right? So I have said, as long as they're comfortable, you know, when I ask this question, just share about that, because I'm going to come to something else later. And I think when the guest trusts me, and so far, I think they all have, I can help them tell their story in a way that resonates to a broad audience, as opposed to they were just like to spit it all out. Yeah, you know enough to guide them, especially to your point earlier about someone who didn't have a, a good experience in yesterday to re-record. And then for these guests that may not have had been on a lot of shows and this person who who survived this activity, I don't know if it was a, a bombing or whatever yeah, it was, no. but it, you know, they probably haven't had a lot of experience being in media. So I think the fact that you're guiding them through the process and ensuring that they tell the story in the best way possible so that it resonates with the widest audience possible, I think is I'm not awesome. a, I'm not a journalist. Know. Right. I'm a podcast host. And my job, if they trust me, is to help them tell their story in a way that can impact as many lives as possible. And not all of them are great storytellers. Right. Not, I mean, some of them, like you said, you know, one minute they were in seat 1A and the next minute they were falling out of the sky, landing on the ground. In this person's case, in their seat on the trunk of a car. I mean, it's just, it was not a bombing. It was a malfunction, I think, okay. by the pilots. But it happened about a year and a half ago. It's a compelling story, remarkable sure. story. And he was actually a pretty good storyteller. But to your point, he'd had some reps now. He was the CEO of a bank. So he was a fairly okay. sophisticated communicator. But I've had people that had remarkable things happen to them that benefited from the magnanimity, right, and the generosity of the host, the intent, the intent of the host. Well, that's a pretty good place to put a pin in it for now, uh, Scott. And what I want to do is actually set up a, a sort of a recurring visit. So every time you have a, when the new book comes Thank out, you. the next mess Thank book you. comes out, come back on and we'll figure out a way to tie it into what's happening in the world of podcasting. So you, you have an open invite for uh, when the, whenever the next book comes out and we've got probably at least eight more <laughs> possible opportunities for that. But just to close on this topic of story, where are you in the story of Scott Miller? No one has ever asked me that question before. You know, I'll be very transparent. After 25 years in a public company and pivoting out, although I still am associated with the company in a variety of roles, not as an employee, as an advisor, I have an eight burner oven stove going on and I have eight skillets on and they're all kind of on a simmer. Some are on like medium and some are boiling. Some are boiling over for good or bad. But what I'm trying to do right now is determine which of those skillets should I be focused on. So my story right now is literally eight skillets. I'm writing three different books in different series. I host the podcast. I have a career coaching business. I'm hosting something with bookclub.com. I have a variety of things going on, speaking and writing. And I'm spending the next probably 18 months being absolutely certain I know which of those skillets is my best meal. So I'll know the answer to that. By the way, all those skillets could be, you know, menu worthy, right? Yeah. I could, you know, but to use a metaphor, I'm not opening a restaurant, people. (laughs) But I think I'm, my story, where I am, my story is my most important role in life is as husband and dad. And I'm trying to be cognizant every day to, you know, keep that going while I've got this, you know, entrepreneurial thing that I'm building that's taking more time than my corporate job did. And so I think as these burners turn off and turn up, I'll be better clear in the next 18 months or so. That's a great answer to that question. And uh, I love the burner analogy. Truthful. And, and it, Truthful. Yeah. And it resonates, I'm sure, with a lot of people, especially entrepreneurs. Yeah. Who always, I've probably got four burners in motion right now, so I can relate to that. I am going to have to summon, again, an unnatural level of focus at some point and turn off six of the eight burners and then get super disciplined. Because right? this is the one thing we know that separates these wildly impactful, influential, successful people is they became fiercely focused on something, one thing. I mean, think about it. This is how we know people, right? We know we know people for the one thing that they've done. I don't know Roger Federer for his stakes. I know him for his tennis. I don't know Tiger Woods for his boating skills. I don't know Doris Kearns Goodwin for her cooking skills, right? This is a metaphor that is, you know, I think ubiquitous. We know them all for something. And if I, I want to leave a legacy beyond just my boys, I want to be influential. I'm going to have to 
make some decisions on what to say no to and what to say, oh, hell yes to. All the more reason to keep tabs on your journey. So it's it's been a pleasure catching up Thank with you, you again, Scott. I love your energy. I love your enthusiasm. And I love the fact that I just had a big idea where this conversation was going. And before you know it, the hour had gone by and you never failed to entertain and educate. So I appreciate you sharing your story and then where you are in your journey. I, I really love it. Thank you for your abundance. Thank you for the platform. Thank you for shining your bright spotlight onto me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Scott. Thanks again to Scott for coming on the show. Always appreciated. As always, full show notes available at podcastjunkies.com forward slash 265. Intro and outro music composed by Cedar and Soil. Cedarsoil.com for his magnificent list of music. Special shout out to our episode sponsor, Focusrite, and their awesome line of gear, specifically the Scarlet 2i2 Pro. Learn more at podcastjunkies.com forward slash focus right. Podcast production and marketing provided by Fullcast. Sign up for a free podcast brainstorm at fullcast.co forward slash chat 15 and learn how a podcast can benefit your company. Next week, I have a great conversation with someone who reached out to me, Brett Allen, host of The Brett Allen Show. It's a little bit of a interview and coaching session and we get really tactical into things podcast hosts can do to grow their show and i really enjoyed the engagement with brett don't miss that one it's going to be next week's episode and if you made it this far you're no doubt waiting anxiously for this week's retention hashtag let's go with marketing scott and you can tag us at podcast underscore junkies and scott at scott miller fc thanks for all you do to support the show don't forget let one friend know about the show and I'll see you next week.